Okay, this time we're going to be talking about the action potential. We finally know enough stuff that we can get into this really, really cool thing. The kind of most basic way uh, neurons talk to one another. This is the most, you can sort of think of it as like the most basic unit of your consciousness. If you want to think of it that way, which I do. Okay, uh, let's get it. All right, this is the graph. This is the graph that you want to know. If you can understand this graph, if you can draw this graph out, label it and explain it to your friends, uh, you understand the action potential. And that's kind of the goal I want you to have uh, here. So we can divide the action potential into a couple of phases. First is the rising phase. This is when uh, the voltage-gated no sodium channels open up and we have an influx of sodium ions, right? So this is the first thing that happens after the threshold of excitation is reached. So we have EPSBs and IPSBs coming in, coming in from everywhere. They're summed up. If we reach the threshold of excitation, that's when our action potential starts. And that's when these voltage-gated sodium channels fly open and all the sodium starts to rush in, right? So they are open at this stage right here. Sodium is coming in, and that's what's leading to this big spike in this graph. So uh, next up on number two on this graph here, our delayed rectifier potassium channels open up. Uh, they're delayed in opening, but uh, these potassium channels open up and uh, potassium starts to leave the cell. But um, we still have the action of our sodium uh, channels here, pushing the potential up and up. Uh, so once we reach the uh, stage three here, we enter the falling phase. This is where the sodium channels close and become refractory. These potassium channels remain open, however, and there is a strong outward potassium current. So uh, lots of positively charged potassium ions rushing out of the cell. And that is uh, the combination of these two things is what causes this to peak and fall off, right? Sodium channels close and become refractory. No more sodium coming in. Potassium channels, though, are still open for business. Potassium is flowing out. Uh, we have no more positive ions coming in, but we do have a lot of positive ions going out, which is going to cause this sharp. Okay, let's talk about refractory periods. First up, we have the absolute refractory period. This is the time during which no stimulus can initiate an action potential. Voltage-gated sodium channels are in an inactive state. So that's basically from here down to here on the curve, right? During this time, these sodium channels are in an active state. That means you can't have the action potential. If those voltage-gated sodium channels won't work, you can't possibly have an action potential. Uh, next is the relative refractory period, which is this undershoot right here. So after the sodium channels reset at 5, uh, we have uh, this undershoot where there is uh, hyperpolarization, right, relative to our resting potential. During this time, we can have an action potential, but we're going to need a little bit more juice to get there, right? Because we're starting from a more hyperpolarized state where we are more negative than normal. We're going to need a lot more EPSPs to get up to this threshold of excitation. So because of this undershoot, uh, this is what we call the relative refractory period. You can have an action potential, but it's going to take a stronger than normal stimulus. Uh, the, this right here, the absolute refractory period, prevents the backward movement of action potentials, right? So you don't have uh, these voltage-gated sodium channels open and going back and forth forever because it can only move in one direction. Action potential starts at the axonhillic, moves down to the terminals, and they only go that one way. It also limits the firing rate. Neurons can only fire so quickly because of this absolute refractory period. They can only fire as fast as the sodium channels can reset. All right, let's talk about the all or none law and the rate law. And I, I promise there's a reason that there's a, a toilet here. The all or none law is the principle that once an action potential is triggered in an axon, it is propagated without decrement to the end of the fiber. So once the action potential begins, it stays at the same strength and propagates its way all the way down to the terminals. And that's how it must work. The rate law is the principle that variations in intensity of a stimulus or other information being transmitted in an axon are represented by variations at the rate in which the axon fires. So if you remember, I said earlier that you can't have a big or a small action potential, right? They're all the same size. But at the same time, you can perceive how bright or dim a light is. So the intensity of that stimulus is represented in your nervous system by how fast the neurons that perceive it are firing, not by how hard they're firing. So 
your neurons are in some ways kind of like a toilet, right? If you flush the toilet handle, you're going to get the same sort of flush every time. It, it goes through the same motion, the same amount of water passes through, it's the same flush. You can push on that handle as hard or as softly as you want, but once you've activated the handle, it goes. Likewise, we have a rate law, right? You can only flush a toilet as quickly as the tank fills, and you can't flush it before it's ready. Here's a demonstration of the, the rate law. So uh, this is pretty abstract, but basically we have a stimulus that's on or off that can be a weak or a strong stimulus. So when the stimulus comes on for a weak stimulus, you see a modest amount of action potentials taking place, representing a weak stimulus. Here, we have a strong stimulus. When it comes on, you see a very high rate of firing. And then it comes off and less. So this is just one way that your nervous system can code the intensity of a stimulus uh, with a higher rate of fire, right? Because you can't have a bigger small action potential. All action potentials are the same, but you can have frequent or infrequent action potentials. So that's one way that our nervous system can represent uh, strength of stimulus. So you've all probably heard that pufferfish carry a deadly neurotoxin, right? It's an exciting thing to eat a pufferfish because if it's not prepared correctly, you'll die. I'm not sure exactly why people do it, but people do it. So the toxin present in pufferfish is called tetrodotoxin, or TTX for short. Um, the way it works is by blocking voltage-gated sodium channels. And this leads to paralysis and possibly death. As little as 25 milligrams, which is not a very large amount, can be lethal to an average-sized adult. So, my question, I guess, is this. Can you kind of speculate why do you think tetrodotoxin is deadly as it is? What would it do? So think about what you know about action potentials and voltage-gated sodium channels. And what exactly do you think would happen as a result of tetrodotoxin being applied to neurons? Uh, and kind of going with that, why do you think that this would be used in research? Because there are applications for this in laboratory research. So um, we'll see how this goes. Go ahead and uh, like leave a comment in perusal if you think you know the answer, or if you have more questions about it, uh, and I can react to that stuff. Okay, let's bring this little piece of the puzzle in. We've talked about myelin a couple of times and how it speeds up conduction. Let's talk about exactly how that works. It works through a process called saltatory conduction because the uh, change in polarity seems to sort of jump from place to place. Saltatory has the same, same root as uh, jump, so jumping conduction. Uh, conduction of action potentials that can happen in myelinated axons. The space between myelin segments is called the no nodes of Ranvier. The AP jumps from one node of Ranvier to the next, and the sodium current is only possible at these nodes. So. We've talked about voltage-gated sodium channels, right? So imagine, and in fact there are, voltage-gated sodium channels present at all of these nodes. So you can imagine that as the action potential reaches these nodes where there are these voltage-gated sodium channels, it's going to cause those channels to open. Then a bunch of sodium ions are going to flow into the cell there and renew the action potential. So every time a... Uh, this action potential reaches a node, it causes those, those voltage-gated sodium channels to open, sodium comes in, and it causes a renewal of the action potential. So we have decremental conduction underneath the myelin sheath, meaning that the signal gets weaker as it goes along, but it's still strong enough to cause these channels to open at the next segment. So it sort of jumps from place to place by moving underneath these. So here's another depiction of how that might work, right? We have the action potential happening, it causes an influx of sodium here, which then disperses down the axon and reaches the next node, which causes the voltage-gated sodium channels present in that node to open, and then allows the sodium to flow in and diffuse its way down here. And remember, because of the, rel the absolute refractory period, any sodium that makes its way back here is not going to cause anything to open, right? These Ion channels are refractory. They cannot be opened by the presence of sodium, right? A, a change in voltage here won't do anything. So the sodium makes its way down and continues to open things uh, from the end of the soma all the way down to the terminal. So that's how the action potential is propagated. These axons are segmented, as I mentioned, by uh, the myelin segments. The AP occurs in one segment, then it will lead to the next segment to reach threshold, 
which will then lead the next segment to, lead, to reach threshold, and so on and so on. Each segment regenerates the action potential, so the signal is transmitted at full strength. Despite the minor decrement that occurs underneath the myelin sheath, it renews at each node, so we can say that the signal is transmitted at full strength. So, because of saltatory conduction, we can say that myelinated axons are more efficient than those that are unmyelinated. You can see here that this is slowed, right? An action potential along a non-myelinated axon would be slowed because it has to activate all of these ion channels along the way, so it's a bit less efficient. Whereas a myelinated axon has only these, has these ion channels at the nodes. So these, on, these channels only have to open at these nodes, so it's more efficient. Okay. So let's compare action potentials to postsynaptic potentials. An action potential forms the axon hillock or the initial segment. That's where it begins. Postsynaptic potentials occur most commonly at the dendrites and the soma. An action potential is binary. It's all or none. You have an action potential or you don't. Postsynaptic potentials are graded. You can have big or small EPSPs and IPSPs. Uh, they aren't uniform. Action potential is always excitatory, right? It's made um, by the propagation of that signal through voltage-gated sodium channels. Whereas a PSB can be excitatory or inhibitory, depending what ions are moving through. The action potential is regenerative, meaning that it will renew at those different points and propagate itself at full strength, whereas a PSB is decremental, right? It will uh, sort of create a brief transient change in voltage, which will sort of quickly be resolved. The action potential can travel a long distance, right? It moves along the extent of a neuron. Uh, and some of our neurons are very, very long, right? Like a neuron from your spine down to, the, uh, to your heel would be a long way to transmit this information. Whereas uh, postsynaptic potentials are local. They're confined mostly just to the region that they, uh, they take place in, so the dendrite or soma. Action potentials are a varying speed, meaning that they can move faster or slower based on a number of different properties we're not discussing. So the, the thickness of the axon, for example, or whether or not the axon is myelinated, whereas post potentials are immediate. All right, that concludes our discussion of the action potential for this time. Uh, next time, we'll talk about how, the, uh, how signaling is terminated and cleaned up.